The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Jesus said, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me about righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer, about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Dear friends, grace and peace to you on this Pentecost Sunday. Amen. Now, I might get myself in trouble for this because I am going to talk about the wind on a day when the wind stilled after yesterday. But it is Pentecost, so here we go. And I am a lover of the wind, as you will find out. And I seem to think, this seems a little crazy, but I feel like I can be in Moorhead and not feel a lot of wind. And I drive just across the river to Fargo, and suddenly it's windy. Now, am I just imagining this? Do I just have it in my mind that there is wind in North Dakota, so when I cross that state line, I experience it as more windy? I don't know, but it is how it seems to me. Now, as many of you know, I am a North Dakota girl. I grew up in a small town in the midst of prairie and farmland. I grew up loving to feel that North Dakota wind on my face. When my first child was born in the midst of winter and we were finally able to push the stroller outside in early spring, even though his first tastes of outdoor air were Minnesota air, I delighted to see him almost tasting and swallowing that air as he encountered it. I like to believe that it was some of the North Dakota heritage in him. So this North Dakota girl loves the wind. And like my mother before me, as long as I am tucked inside a safe space, I even love the howling wind of a blizzard. So imagine my delight when I learned that the word for spirit in both Hebrew and Greek, the original languages of the Old and New Testament, is the word for breath or wind. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It is the Sunday of the loud rushing wind of the Holy Spirit. We heard the story in our first lesson of the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, and I want to put our focus on that today. To place ourselves in time, as the first lesson took place, it was still just the early followers of Jesus. Jesus had ascended into heaven, and now the apostles and the others gathered with them had to figure out what to do. And as you heard in the first lesson, Jesus' followers were gathered together, and suddenly there came from heaven the sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. Imagine for a moment being there with the disciples as this happened that loud rushing wind sound that filled the whole house, those divided tongues as of fire. 
we can only imagine because we don't quite know what it was like. But it sounds mysterious and amazing. And then the wonder continues, for next the followers of Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in languages other than their own as the Spirit gave them ability. Now these disciples and the other followers that were with them, they are the ones who speak in the story. But if you have speakers, you always need hearers. And as the story unfolds, we hear about those who were the hearers. They were described as devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. You might be wondering why there were Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. Most likely, they were Jewish pilgrims who had come to celebrate. It was actually the time of a Jewish festival, Shavuot, or Pentecost. It was 50 days after Passover, and Pentecost, Pent, 50. Devout Jews were to travel to Jerusalem, to the temple, for this festival. Likely, then, that is who is gathered on this historic day recorded in Acts. But now, if you apply your natural curiosity, you might also start to wonder how there were these Jews who were spread out everywhere. It's called the Jewish diaspora, which means they were spread out across the world. And this all started to happen a long time ago, back in 722 BC. The northern kingdom of Israel had fallen to the Assyrians, and the Israelites had been sent from their land. They scattered to many different places. Then around 600 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah fell, and its citizens were sent away. It's called the Babylonian captivity, if you've heard that before. Imagine what happens when there is war or defeat and your country comes under a new leader. People get exiled. People get sent away. People leave to find new homes. The same is what happened for the Jews, and they made new homes in new lands. And so from our first lesson happening, all of that started to happen 750 years earlier. So imagine the generations that had been away from Jerusalem. They had developed new lives in these other countries. They had likely picked up the customs of the places where they lived. Their children would be native speakers of this new language. Their children would grow up speaking this language, living in the culture, having friends who had always been part of that culture. Imagine if you know the story of your ancestors, if they came to this country, how the changes took place over generations. And imagine how it is that the longer you stay, the more you become entwined. Marriages happen, foods change, cultures change, language changes. The Jewish diaspora was vast. You heard the ancient names for the places where they were from. I always like to connect this to a modern day map. So if you look on a modern day map, these countries have contemporary names. They are Iran and Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Turkey, Egypt, Libya, Crete, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, and Italy. Imagine that. Spread that far. Many different cultures and places. And all of this was mixing in Jerusalem. And then along comes the Holy Spirit. And it is heard. And so this, devout, this crowd of devout Jews gather. And they are bewildered because what happens is that they can hear what is being spoken in their own languages. Not just one language, but multiple languages. And they were amazed and astonished because they also knew that the speakers were Galileans who did not speak their own languages. And they knew they could hear it, they could understand. It's as if they were at home, but they weren't. The Holy Spirit rushes in and everything changes. The apostles are speaking and it is suddenly heard in the language of the hearers 
and the hearers can understand. And something happens in that mix of speaking and hearing, and lives are changed. Now, some thought, as you heard in the story, that the only possible explanation was that the apostles must have been drinking, must be the wine. But Peter speaks up and sets the record straight. He tells them that this was foretold in their own scriptures from the prophet Joel, and he quotes Joel to them. And then the first lesson ends there. But if you keep reading, Peter then preaches a sermon about who God is, who Jesus was, and how Jesus gave his life, and that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, something happened, because those who heard were converted and baptized, and there were around 3,000 of them. And so it begins. Jesus' followers are no longer 12 apostles and a few others. The church, the collection of followers of Jesus, is born. It is already over 3,000 people. And the book of Acts, where this story is, tells story after story about people hearing the message and becoming baptized and becoming followers of Jesus. Now, I can only imagine that some of those who were gathered that day then went back to their homes, to their home countries. And so they would have taken this new faith with them. So it's suddenly easy to imagine how Christianity went from a local phenomenon to a global religion. From its very beginning, think about this, from its very beginning, the church had many languages and many cultures. From the very beginning, the church was diverse and varied. It was born in the midst of a swirl of cultures and languages. And in its birthing, the Holy Spirit made it possible for everyone to hear in their own languages. Now, having spent some time living amongst other languages and interacting with people who had another first language than I did, I have a deep appreciation for what it's like to hear the message in your own language. And I have a deep appreciation for how sometimes you need things in your first language. You need that depth of vocabulary. You need that long memory of that language in order to be able to understand what is truly being said. I'm used to being amongst people where we are interacting and then there's a sidebar moment where it's just a minute, we need to talk about this in our language. And then the person most fluent in English shares with me, here's what we talked about, here's why we stopped for a moment, because we needed more words from our own language. And so here this Holy Spirit does this on this day. And in this, as God comes to each person through what is being spoken, God is using the tools of language. And think about the hearers. They didn't have to change or adapt to learn something new in order to hear God's message. God reached them as they were, with who they were. Culture and language were honored. The particularities of who each person was was honored rather than changed first. There's a story in the Old Testament about the Tower of Babel. In that story, there was first only one language. But then, as you might know the story goes, people were building a city and a tower and striving to make a name for themselves. And God could see that they would be doing so much. And so God confused their language so they could not understand one another's speech. And God scattered them abroad and from around, all around the face of the earth. And there were suddenly many languages. Some people like to say that today's first lesson is a reversal of the Tower of Babel, but I see it differently. Things are not changed back into one language. Diversity remains. People's own identities and languages and cultures remain. The Holy Spirit makes it possible for people of different cultures to interact and to understand. People are changed in their own languages by the message of God's love and redemption. So maybe you're thinking, well, that's really interesting, 
But so what? How does this connect to today? Is this just biblical history? Is it a geography lesson? Is it a remembrance of a historical event? Well, Pentecost could be those things, but it's not simply just those things. It really matters for us today. Here we are in Minnesota in 2018. As I, I have the best view here, I can look around the room. You can peek around the room as well. You know a lot of people who are here. Not a lot of international diversity here today, I don't think. Some ethnic diversity. I don't know everybody's ethnic heritage, but I think there's some ethnic similarity here as well. But here I am talking about diversity. Is this story for us? Absolutely. Diversity is not just about languages and cultures. It's about all kinds of ways of being diverse. So of a course, as a body, we are made up of many members. And therefore, we have diversity. You are not all the same. You are each unique individuals. You are each part of the body, a unique part of the body. And so for our life together, I wonder, how do we honor the holy in the other? When we have conflicts or differing perspectives, how do we consider that maybe the Holy Spirit is at work in the midst of our diversity and our differences? In a culture that pushes us to assimilate and to be like others, how do we find the diversity and celebrate this and lift it up? How do we live from the idea that we need diversity, that we are stronger for our diversity? And I think there's something else going on here for us in this day, in 2018, at Christ the King Lutheran Church. Because as I think about this congregation, I think I'm right that you are still anxious. How could you not be? You're in the midst of a major transition, right? The past is no longer there. The past was solid. You relied on it. It's not still there. The future, maybe some of you see it emerging, but it's not yet clearly visible. We are in between those two places. For most people, that's not a comfortable place to be. So here's what strikes me from this Acts lesson, is that the Holy Spirit showed up. Full stop. The Holy Spirit showed up and new life was found. That is what the Holy Spirit does, then and now. And second, the Holy Spirit showed up and made it possible for the hearers to hear and to be given new life. The Holy Spirit did not come and ordain a pastor in this story. The Holy Spirit did not come and appoint a leadership structure. The Holy Spirit did not come and pay off the mortgage. The Holy Spirit came and stirred up a crowd and equipped some leaders, and the church was born. Not church as a structure or as a building or with a certain type of leader. Church as people of God. Friends, you are the church. Plain and simple, you are the church. Yep, you're waiting for a settled lead pastor to come and to provide some direction and energy. But you're not passive bystanders. You are the church. You are enough. Regardless of who comes to be or pastor or how, how long that takes, you are the church, and you are enough. The Holy Spirit has called you into this and has gathered this community together. You are the whole deal. And fear not, it is not on your own power, because it is the Holy Spirit who gathers us together. The Holy Spirit comes. That is what she does. And when she does, she does what she is best at. She comes as a loud rushing wind or as a quiet breath of life. She comes and she shows up in our lives, in our communities, and above all in the body of the believers called the church. She reaches us as we are in our own language and our own particularities. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are commissioned as believers into actions we were not expecting. 
the Holy Spirit keeps moving and shaping as that new life is created. You, the church, you are commissioned and you are built up and then you are sent forth in ways that you don't imagine or expect. But that is what the Holy Spirit does. That is her work. So on this Pentecost day at the Lutheran Church of Christ the King in 2018, you can trust that the Holy Spirit is among us and working. You can trust the Holy Spirit is with you as you go into this future yet to be found. Thanks be to God. Amen.